Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon um, in this uh, terrific facility. And um, I think everyone has made it through the security line uh, and is here. Um, uh, we're delighted today um, to um, have you join us in a presentation and discussion of uh, my colleague Bonnie Glazer's new report on Taiwan's quest for greater participation in the international community, what sometimes is called uh, international space. This is an important issue for the people on Taiwan, of course, um, but it's also an important issue for the United States and other democracies who um, fundamentally believe that while there is greater stability in cross-straits relations, um, ultimately, uh, Taiwan's democracy is an example for the rest of Asia, one to be respected, um, and that there are legitimate and important issues uh, in international organizations that are discussed where the people of Taiwan um, deserve and, 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 and we need to see them get a seat at the table. So Bonnie has done, um, as she often uh, has in the past on similar issues, um, a thorough assessment of the problem and a set of recommendations that are balanced, practical and implementable. Um, and we're going to come back to that in a discussion uh, with Bonnie about the um, report. Um, a bit about how we'll organize our um, hour and a half here today. Um, we uh, are um, uh, very much appreciative to Michael Schiffer um, uh, from the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and the Taiwan Caucus members for making this room available. We had expected um, uh, the two leaders of the Taiwan uh, caucus, Senators Menendez and Inhofe, to open up the proceedings. They're cloistered with Senator Kerry now um, talking about Iran. Um, I'm sure that's not going so pleasantly for Senator Kerry, but um, they're, 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 they're over there right now. Uh, and uh, if they join us, we're going to stop um, wherever we are in the proceedings and invite them to make some comments. Um, we also have um, a, uh, a message from President Ma uh, which um, uh, my friend uh, Liu Li, the assistant director um, for TechRow, uh, will read shortly. Then we'll um, turn to Bonnie to introduce the report to you, and then um, Ambassador Li and Bonnie and I will have a brief discussion, then we'll open it up for your questions and comments on the report. Um, before I start, let me uh, also um, uh, recognize um, uh, Barbara Shragi, and Joe Donovan. Barbara is close to the end of a very distinguished uh, service period as the managing director of AIT. She was in the job when I went to the NSC. <clears throat> Without her, I would have been lost, and I'm sure that's true for the other NSC senior directors, assistant secretaries of state, commerce, uh, pretty much every part of the US government and US Congress that depend on her to uh, steer us in the right direction on uh, our full gamut of issues, relationships, cooperation, and friendship with the people of Taiwan. <clears throat> so I just want to first, um, it's a little early because she still has a few weeks, <clears throat> no senior slump, not allowed to back off yet, <clears throat> but uh, I just wanted to quickly um, thank her um, and also welcome Joe Donovan who will be um, taking her place. <clears throat> They're overlapping by a few weeks, so they have to sit together everywhere. <laughs> um, but if you could just join me, I want to thank Barbara very much for her service and, and, and what she's done for us. <clears throat> She has a few weeks, <laughs> and I am sure we'll be seeing a lot more of her even after that. And, uh, and, uh, and good luck to Joe, who's, a, who's an esteemed uh, uh, scholar, an expert, and diplomat on Asia, and a good friend of Taiwan, and, and, a, and, a, and a terrific uh, person for the job. <clears throat> um, so let's uh, um, turn it over now to Ambassador Liu Li. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, ambassador Li was uh, ambassador in St. Vincent's and the Grenades in the Caribbean. And, after the past few days ice storm, I'm sure he'd rather be there. Um, <laughs> but we're delighted he joined us. And, and we'll open up, if we could, with yeah. uh, the message you brought from okay. President Ma. Yeah. Hello. Uh, it's an honor for me to uh, read a message from our president, President Ma ying uh, Chairman Menendez, Senator Inhofe, Senior Advisor Glazer, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm delighted that the Center for Strategic and International Studies is able to host this event to discuss the important issue of Taiwan's international participation and U.S. support for its effort in this regard. As President of the Republic of China, 
I would like to express appreciation to Chairman Robert Menendez and Senator James Inhofe for taking part in this event today. The two co-chairs of the Senate Taiwan Caucus, Chairman Menendez and Senator Inhofe, have both been great friends of my country for years. Both of them steadfastly support Taiwan and its effort to participate meaningfully on the world stage. The introduction of S-579 by both senators in support of Taiwan's participation in the International Civil Aviation Organization early this year led to the passage of a law that has helped Taiwan secure an invitation for the first time after a departure of 42 years to the ICAO Assembly as a special guest in September. Their presence today demonstrates the enduring support for my country in the US Congress, support that is deeply appreciated by Taiwan. I would also like to, uh, I would also be remiss if I did not thank uh, Ms. Bonnie Glazers and her team from CSIS for writing a report entitled Taiwan's Challenges as an International Actor. Their report is the most comprehensive study of the need for Taiwan's full participation in international organizations we have seen in recent years. We appreciate uh, Ms. Grace's scholarship and her interest in Taiwan. And we are excited this report is being unveiled today. Finally, I would like to wish for the success of today's event and look forward to receiving all of you good friends in Taiwan again soon. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Ambassador Lee. And what President Ma said about Senators um, Inhofe and, and uh, Menendez uh, is, um, is absolutely right. If it weren't for this closed-door hearing on Iran, they, I'm certain, would have been here because of the importance they place on this issue and on our friendship with Taiwan and the leadership they've shown uh, in the caucus and in our Asia policy overall until now. Um, but their leadership positions in the SASC and SFRC make it you know, basically impossible to not be in this uh, meeting right now with Secretary Kerry at a critical time in our Iran diplomacy. And we may yet see them. Um, so with that, let me turn it over to Bonnie to introduce the report. Um, and then we'll hear further comments from Ambassador Lee, and then we'll open it up for a roundtable and an audience discussion. Great. Well, thanks to uh, all of you for coming, uh, Michael Schiffer, to help, uh, for helping organize this, uh, to Senators Menendez and Inhofe, of course, for their support uh, on this very, very important issue, uh, to my colleague Mike Green and also to Ambassador uh, Lee for joining today. Um, this is an issue that I attach uh, a lot of importance to, and I think it's important, as, uh, as uh, Mike Green said, not only for the United States, uh, certainly for Taiwan, but also uh, for the broader international uh, community. Um, as you know, uh, Taiwan faces uh, challenges in uh, participating in the international community in various ways, um, in international organizations, um, whether they be UN-affiliated or not. Um, and uh, even in non-governmental organizations where uh, Beijing never misses uh, an opportunity to constrain uh, Taiwan's space uh, to have its, uh, its voice heard. Uh, there are a lot of costs for excluding Taiwan from the international community. Um, first, of course, for um, the 23 million people uh, of Taiwan. Um, and perhaps the best example of this was in 2003 uh, when the SARS epidemic uh, broke out. Uh, Taiwan did not receive information in a timely manner. Um, and that was, of course, very harmful uh, to people in Taiwan who were not only trying to fight the disease from spreading uh, in Taiwan, but also to share information with other nations um, about how the epidemic uh, was spreading and how it was particularly spreading from uh, the mainland to Taiwan. Even beyond that, though, um, uh, the exclusion of Taiwan from many international organizations uh, erodes Taiwan's competitiveness and it hampers Taiwan's integration um, in, uh, in the regional economy. And uh, I talk about in the report uh, Taiwan's efforts to uh, join, uh, which are really, I think, just getting underway seriously to join uh, in, in over the next perhaps few years uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership and also um, RCEP. 
Um, and of course, uh, Taiwan's recent successes in, in, uh, in signing uh, agreements, um, uh, trade agreements, uh, first with uh, New Zealand and uh, then with Singapore. Um, this is really important for Taiwan because both of these countries are founding members of TPP. And I think that Taiwan will look uh, to be negotiating more agreements in the future. And in the report, I talk about some of those, um, uh, the status of some of those uh, negotiations. So um, as far as the cost to the, to the international community, it's quite clear that uh, keeping Taiwan out of many organizations prevents Taiwan from adding its, uh, its knowledge, its skills, um, and its resources uh, to many organizations. And, and, and Taiwan is a leading actor um, in so many areas. Um, and we can take something like uh, the, uh, the UN uh, framework on um, uh, convention on, on climate change as an example where uh, Taiwan's NGO participation is really, really active and adds a great deal, uh, but um, uh, Taiwan's uh, government is uh, so far uh, does not have uh, a seat at the table. So Taiwan's approach has really been to uh, gradually expand its participation pretty much on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, under President Ma, we've seen some important uh, achievements. Um, the first was really becoming a, an observer at the World Health Assembly in 2009. And um, as uh, Ambassador Lee mentioned, this year Taiwan was invited uh, for the first time to be a guest at uh, the International Civil Aviation Organization uh, Assembly. Um, or ICAO. But even these successes um, are incomplete. Uh, Taiwan's still not a member of the WHO's uh, Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, for example. And um, although Taiwan did attend this recent triennial meeting of uh, ICAO, um, there's really no path forward that is so far that's going to enable Taiwan to participate in uh, ICAO meetings, to contribute to them, um, uh, to join in the deliberations. And uh, I hope uh, that there will be efforts uh, by Taiwan, by the US and, and other countries to try and push for Taiwan to become an observer in the, in the ICAO Council uh, in the future. Um, and the US, uh, the US should, should, should certainly help Taipei to, uh, to achieve that goal. Um, I talk a bit in the report about some of the obstacles uh, to Taiwan uh, expanding its participation in, uh, in the international community, and, and the biggest, of course, um, is Beijing. Um, and as, uh, as we know, uh, China opposes treating Taiwan uh, as a sovereign state, but the problems really go beyond that. Um, and in my discussions with uh, uh, officials uh, in, in Beijing uh, over many, many years, um, and also in preparing this report, I had a delegation uh, that went to both sides of the strait to talk about this issue. And uh, former Assistant uh, Secretary uh, James Kelly, who many of you know, uh, headed the delegation. And uh, one of the things that I think was reinforced in our conversations uh, was that there's concern in, uh, in the mainland that Taiwan's, uh, if Taiwan is given greater international uh, presence, then um, that could be used to press somehow for independence in, in the future. Um, one would hope that with China's growing confidence, its uh, capabilities, its power economically and politically and militarily, uh, that China would become uh, more confident in itself um, and give Taiwan the opportunity uh, to play a role in any organization that it really wants to uh, participate in or be uh, a member of. Uh, so um, I think that um, uh, it's extremely unlikely that Taiwan would be able to leverage its participation in an inter international organization to achieve uh, de jure independence. Uh, but there it is. This is this is continues to be a uh, a concern which I think is really unfounded, uh, but one that the international community really should push back on. Um, Beijing's policy of squeezing Taiwan's international space is also quite um, obviously contrary to China's own goals of winning support from the Taiwan public for better cross-strait relations. Uh, if when, uh, all uh, polls that have been done of uh, people in Taiwan show that participating more in the international community is very high on the list of what 
Taiwan people uh, want to see uh, their government achieve for them. And so when China blocks this, uh, this right, um, when it uh, interferes, uh, even in the case of um, NGOs or Taiwan uh, uh, film producers or actors and actresses or even recently singers uh, in, uh, in various events around the world, uh, I think it creates a very, very negative um, attitude on, among people in Taiwan, which does not help Beijing's goal of increasing um, and improving the, uh, the cross-strait relationship. So um, U.S. support um, from both Congress and the executive branch, I think, for Taiwan's efforts to expand its international space is uh, critically important. And uh, Ambassador Lee talked about the support that Senators Mendez and Inhofe uh, gave uh, in first introducing the legislation, which later became law, that directed the Secretary of State to develop a strategy to obtain observer status uh, for Taiwan uh, and the, uh, in, in ICAO. Um, and there's more work to be done on this uh, in the future. Uh, but that's, that assistance, that support is critically important. I would say that uh, the combination of support, and it is really all of these these for these elements working together of U.S. Congress, of the executive branch, of other nations, not just the United States, and also continued pressure on Beijing, that all of these are needed to further promote Taiwan's role in the international community. Now, I'm now going to just summarize a few of the recommendations that, uh, that I've made in this report. There are numerous. I'm not going to go into all of them. Um, uh, and I do... Uh, take uh, first them individually, Taiwan, mainland China, and then the United States. Uh, so I think the most important thing for Taiwan is really uh, domestically, Taiwan has to undertake the, the adjustments in its own economy to be more open uh, so that it can be a, a part of the regional integration process and it can prepare uh, to join TPP uh, in the future. Um, the pace and the scope of economic liberalization um, is completely under Taiwan's control. This is something that uh, I think the government in Taiwan needs to do. And the faster that Taipei moves domestically, the more options that it will have uh, internationally with regard to participation in regional trade and regional uh, investment opportunities. Um, second, again, is on the issue of bilateral trade agreements. I've mentioned this, the, the agreements with Singapore and with New Zealand. Uh, these, again, may facilitate a path for Taiwan to join TPP in the future, so more of those uh, should go forward. Uh, when Taiwan deals with mainland China, it sets what it sees as priorities. Uh, and I think that when President Ma chooses his priorities very carefully and he pushes for them, he is often successful. This is an issue. Taiwan's greater international space, that Taiwan has to make a priority with the mainland. Uh, in pushing uh, Xi Jinping uh, to provide more, more opportunity for Taiwan, to block Taiwan less, uh, there, is a, there could be a greater uh, possibility uh, to really make more, more progress. Uh, it must be an issue on the cross-strait agenda, uh, because if Beijing wants to continue to veto or block Taiwan's uh, participation, they can continue to do so. A few um, items on the list for uh, Beijing. Um, the Chinese need to recognize that, uh, again, that uh, their policy of stifling Taiwan's participation in the international community simply br breeds distrust in Taiwan, and it's contrary to China's interests in improving cross-strait uh, ties. Uh, Beijing really should be more magnanimous and demonstrate some goodwill on this issue. Uh, it is really important uh, for Taiwan. Um, it will also send signals to the rest of the world about whether China is going to be a willing to give in order to get so that it can have a better relationship. If it can have a better relationship with Taiwan, then maybe other neighbors will draw some conclusions uh, that it too can have better relations with China and, uh, and, and benefit from China's rise. Um, I want to mention one thing that's very specific. Um, it may seem like a, like a trivial item, but I think it is really important that China needs to instruct its foreign ministry to stop constraining Taiwan's international space. It needs to tear up the uh, Memorandum of Understanding that was uh, signed with the World Health Organization. No future such MOUs should be signed that uh, dictate what uh, any international organization should do um, in dealing with Taiwan that is somehow unique in the organization. This has created a lot of ill will 
uh, in Taiwan, uh, and I think it was very unfortunate that it happened uh, in the case of the WHO. And then um, uh, the third thing for, uh, for the mainland is to provide um, unqualified support and assistance for Taiwan to participate in the regional economic integration process. Um, Taiwan's ability to participate in regional um, economic cooperation has really been eliminated, uh, uh, limited other than through APEC. Uh, and there, uh, there's a lot more that uh, um, uh, that Taiwan should be doing in the regional economic integration process, including um, uh, participating in RCEP um, and uh, joining other organizations like the East Asia Summit, which is more than just uh, than economic. Um, so for the U.S., um, the U.S. I think should be more proactive in urging other nations to support uh, Taiwan's participation in the international community. Uh, the U.S. has done uh, some things quietly, which are important, and there are certain times we have to keep things quiet, and there are other times that we have to speak out publicly. Um, and in addition to doing more for Taiwan, I think we actually incur need to encourage other countries uh, to do more. Uh, there's a lot of nations out there that are, I think, a little nervous <clears throat> about saying things publicly in support of Taiwan. There's actually safety in numbers. You get a lot of countries out there talking in support of something. Uh, China's not going to punish uh, the entire international community. Uh, we also need to press Beijing, I think, regularly to stop uh, squeezing in Taiwan's international space. And then finally, um, uh, and this is really a recommendation both for uh, Beijing and Washington, and it's one that I heard uh, in uh, the mainland from several scholars. I don't know if the, if, the, uh, if the government in Beijing is ready to support this, but the fact that scholars mention it, I think, at least holds out the promise that it could provide a longer term, more, um, uh, ex uh, a broader solution to the problem of Taiwan's international space. And that is um, looking into revising the existing charters for international uh, organizations. Uh, this might have to be done on a case by case basis, and an international lawyer would certainly have to be uh, consulted. But if the t China is very focused, on the issue of the legality of Taiwan participating. And therefore, if there can be created in various charters um, a new definition of, for example, observer status that does not um, necessarily say that sovereign states uh, are, can be the only members, then that might open up the door uh, for Taiwan's greater uh, participation. Um, of course, this is something we would do only with Taiwan's support. Uh, but if uh, Beijing and Washington could work with other members of uh, the international community to rewrite some of these charters and create uh, various, may maybe a new category for Taiwan's membership or revise the existing categories, um, then that might uh, address some of Beijing's concerns and open up the door for Taiwan to participate um, for uh, in many of these organizations in the future. And I'll stop there. Excellent. Thank you. We'll go into more detail on some of the recommendations in the report, but let me first ask Ambassador Lee for some comments. <clears throat> well, uh, thank you. Uh, I was given 10 minutes to uh, report on the status of Taiwan's participation in international organization and U.S. support. So I hope I can finish that uh, within the time limit. Uh, Dr. Green, Bonnie, uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to be here with such a distinguished audience. First of all, I would like to uh, <coughs> thank the uh, CSIS for the kind invitation. I would also like to thank Bonnie uh, for writing this very informative report. Personally, I uh, learned a lot from reading her report. I read it twice, once over the weekend, <laughs> uh, the other one uh, over the, uh, during the uh, snowstorm. <coughs> okay, uh, we live, as you know, we live in a global village. Today, more than ever before, opportunity and threats transcend national borders. Supply chains are global, but so are terrorist networks. More people travel around the world faster than ever before. The so could potential pandemics. Opportunities and threats are global, and our response to them must also be global. Uh, this is the rationality behind international cooperation and the guiding spirit behind the creation of dozens of international organizations over the last century. However, Taiwan's ability to work with the international community was severely reduced. Taiwan left the UN in <coughs> <excuse> me, <coughs> 1971 
And to this day, our participation in international organizations is rather limited. This is not by choice. Taiwan actively seeks to join international organizations and to work with partners around the world. But when we try to engage, we are not offered a seat at the table. Taiwan's exclusion from most international organizations not only harms Taiwan's national interests, but also harms our collective interests and global commons. It not only harms the well-being of Taiwan's citizens, but also people hundreds of miles away. Uh, let me share one example of the real-world impact. The response to the SARS outbreak in 2003 was impaired by Taiwan's exclusion from the WHO, which is charged with stopping the spread of epidemic. Our exclusion from global decision-making poses serious risk for the international community. When we are not at the table to provide real-time data and analysis, whether on H691 uh, avian flu at the WHO or nuclear non-proliferation at the IAEA, the international community loses timely access to valuable and actionable information. Taiwan's voice is not heard when it is needed most. With its track record of regional leadership and its commitment to democratic values and free market principles, Taiwan will be an asset to these international organizations. I'm confident that one day, with your help, we will obtain observer status or membership in all relevant international organizations. One recent example of Taiwan's leadership is the East China Sea Peace Initiative, spearheaded by President Ma. Taiwan claims the Diaoyutai Islands as our own, but Beijing and Tokyo have issued competing territorial and maritime claims. Recognizing that the prospect of confrontation and escalation was very real and extremely dangerous, President Ma developed and advanced the East China Sea Peace Initiative on August 5, uh, 2012, to demonstrate that a different path and more hopeful outcome is possible. The East China Sea Peace Initiative, as well as our recent fishery agreement with Japan, elevates peaceful negotiation over confrontation. It de-emphasizes the territorial nature of the dispute and focuses on resource sharing and cooperation. Taiwan thus is leading the way in reducing tensions in East Asia. Just think what we would do, what we could do as full participants on the world stage. At present, Taiwan enjoys membership in only 34 of the 5,000 intergovernmental organizations. More than 2,000 Taiwanese non-governmental organizations seek international participation, but many have struggled to attend it. For Taiwan, participation in international organizations is about more than advancing our own national interests. Enhanced international engagement will enable us to provide more humanitarian and development assistance. Countries in need could benefit from the example of Taiwan's development experience. But unfortunately, we are limited in the kind of exchanges and assistance we can provide. Fortunately, however, over the years, our friends in the United States have actively supported Taiwan's international participation. In a speech in October, Deputy Assistant Secretary Kim Moy reaffirmed US support for Taiwan's membership, and I quote, in international organizations where statehood is not a requirement and encourages Taiwan's meaningful participation in organizations where its membership is not possible, unquote. We appreciate the support of Deputy Assistant Secretary Moy and other US officials who have spoken out on our behalf. The US Congress has also passed numerous resolutions on a bipartisan basis, supporting Taiwan's international participation. As you know, Taiwan was recently invited for the first time to attend the 38th Assembly of the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, as a guest of the President of ICAO Council. After years of exclusion from ICAO, this development is a major step forward in Taiwan's speed to join ICAO as an observer. At a critical, critical moment in this effort, S579, co-sponsored by Chairman Menendez and Senator Inhofe, 
and its accompanying legislations in the House passed through both chambers with unanimous support and was signed into law by President Obama on July 12, 2013. This fully complemented an earlier congressional effort regarding Taiwan's participation in the WHO, S-2092, which was signed into law by President George W. Bush on June 14, 2004. The message this piece of legislation sent to the international community was very clear. On matters of international participation, the United States stands with Taiwan. Taiwan also aspired to join the Regional Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, as soon as possible. And with US help, we believe it is achievable. Speaking at the event at Brookings Institution on November 20th, our former Vice President, Vincent Xiao, explained that the goal of the trade mission he headed was to rejuvenate bilateral economic relations by demonstrating our longstanding dedication and ties to the United States, as well as seeking US support for Taiwan's bid to join the TPP. Ladies and gentlemen, as a democracy, Taiwan seeks to fully shoulder the responsibility and opportunities that came with full participation in the international community. In fact, we believe our national security is inextricably linked to our ability to participate fully in the global community. At a speech at CSI's video conference in 2011, President Ma said that, and I quote, enhancing Taiwan's contributions to international development, end quote, is our second line of defense in our national security. We will continue to push for increased international space, but we cannot do it alone. We need the help of friendly countries like the United States to amplify our cause for participation. In this regard, we want to express our gratitude to all of you for your continued support. Thank you for your attention, and may you all have a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, Ambassador Lee. I um, appreciate your remarks very much, uh, both of you. I thought it was very useful that you mentioned, Ambassador Lee, um, the East China Sea Peace Initiative um, and some of the associated diplomacy by, by your government uh, with the Philippines, which uh, is very relevant in this discussion because although those are not issues necessarily covered by the international organizations we're talking about, what it demonstrates is that if Taiwan is at the table, it will bring ideas, it will bring 21st century concepts of rule of law, of win-win of resolutions based on market principles, um, and would I think bring up um, the level of discussion in all of these organizations, and um, frankly might put a little bit of healthy pressure on Beijing to also increase its um, level of uh, contribution and participation. Uh, Taiwan's per capita contribution in the wake of the 2004 tsunami, the Japanese um, uh, March 11, 2011 uh, disaster, the most recent um, typhoon in the Philippines, far, far outpaces uh, China's. Um, I've been a little bit surprised, frankly, that um, the, the Chinese foreign ministry in each successive crisis announces amounts that are minuscule <laughs> in response to the humanitarian needs. So it might actually help create a little bit of healthy competition uh, in addition to everything else, in addition to what it does for um, Taiwan's legitimate need to get information and participate in the discussions. It might actually help set an example for Chinese diplomats and Chinese participants in what um, a, uh, a 21st century, um, I'll say, responsible stakeholder, which is the phrase of art when I was in government, but what a 21st century responsible stakeholder does to contribute to international society. And I think there are many, as Bonnie points out, in the Chinese foreign ministry and the Chinese system who would like to do that. I think it's, it's, it's not, it's not uh, zero sum. Um, let me now do to Bonnie something that's incredibly unfair that hopefully she won't do to me on my next report, <laughs> um, and that is ask about the prospects for implementation. Um, usually think tanks don't worry about that, but we at CSIS <laughs> pride ourselves on being just a little more results-oriented and pragmatic. Um, my, my, well, first of all, this report is the most comprehensive study of this, of this topic, um, and the recommendations are the most comprehensive, and they're well within um, the bounds of reasonable and pragmatic. 
And my guess is that um, you would not get a lot of disagreement uh, from current senior officials at NSC State um, uh, who work on Asia. Um, and you wouldn't have gotten it from me and my colleagues in Bush and probably wouldn't have been Clinton for the senior director for Asia, the deputy assistant secretary and assistant secretaries at state and so forth. My experience has always been with international space. The problem isn't the Asia people. The problem is you have to get very busy, overtaxed um, assistant secretaries of state for international organizations, uh, the people at Department of Energy or the EPA, just to name one example in the news lately, or other agencies um, who have a huge complicated agenda with these international organizations are under constant pressure from Congress that often, that often doesn't like these international organizations. And you're asking them to uh, prioritize Taiwan, which is, is good for these organizations. It's very good for US Asia policy, but it's, 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 it's an extra task for them that they often don't like. And, and I found that usually, therefore, it has to come from the top. That sometimes, if you're the senior director for Asia, you're the DAS or assistant secretary of state, you can get your colleague in the International Organizations Bureau or in commerce to agree, because they've been to Taiwan, they like Taiwan, it's a democracy, they see the advantage. But more often than not, they have so much on their plate, they think, good God, another homework assignment. And you, and you therefore have to get some buy-in from the secretary of state or commerce, the national security advisor, somebody higher up. In uh, about 11 years ago, um, we had that when Tommy Thompson was the Secretary of Health and Human Services. He gave a speech calling for Japan's, excuse me, Taiwan's participation in the WHA. We, um, uh, I called my then uh, colleague in uh, the Deputy Chief Cabinet Secretary, Shinzo Abe, and got Japan on board. We talked to the Australians and the Canadians. It took a real effort, um, and it took some top-level encouragement and cover. Um, and it, and, and, it, and it has results when you do that, but, but, um, but it requires somebody who's got a long list of problems in U.S.-China relations or somebody who has a long list of issues with the WHO or the WHA to decide this is important. So um, how, do you, how do you convince them? If you had to make the brief to help the people in the East Asia Bureau, the Asia, East Asia Bureau or NSC who I think would be generally supportive, what, what's the case if you could refine it a little bit more, why should they take this on, given everything else on their plate? And do you think they will? <laughs> well, you, you, your, your approach, Mike, is uh, very practical and very important. Uh, first, I would say that some of the reasons why we do, weren't doing more in the U.S.-Taiwan relationship um, in sort of the, you know, the later years of Chen Shui-bian had to do with the nature of his policies, right? And uh, so people did not want to stick their necks out for uh, Taiwan for fear that this might embolden President Chun. Uh, and there, were, there was a sense that, uh, you know, Taiwan wasn't really contributing enough to the stability of the U.S.-Taiwan relationship. We're in a very different situation right now. Um, and as cross-strait relations have improved, this has opened up space, I think, for the U.S. to do more for Taiwan. And we have, in fact, seen this. Um, and uh, so to put international space aside for just a second, clearly um, the, those who work on East Asia have been um, successful in convincing senior people in the Obama administration to do things like approve the F-16 upgrades uh, for Taiwan um, and visa waiver, which was very, very important for President Ma. Um, and probably not the easiest thing to do. I mean, Homeland Security had a lot of other issues on its plate. So you're right. Somebody from a senior position had to say, this is going to be a priority. We're going to get this done. We haven't seen this happen, I think, enough in the international space area. And uh, if the only issue were opposition from Beijing, um, uh, then I think we wouldn't be doing some of these other things for Taiwan. So I think we really ought to be stepping up to the plate because we are able to do a range of things uh, for Taiwan. Now, let's uh, at least accept that for the time being, as we have these charters in existence, uh, the United States has said on the record, we don't support independence for Taiwan. So we are not going to be pushing for Taiwan to be a full member of an organization that requires um, sovereign status as long as there's uh, the uh, the charter has the charters have the wording that they do. 
but there's still so much more uh, that we could be doing because there are um, there are so many ways that Taiwan can participate. And there's observer status, of course, and associate member, a corresponding member, and you'll see this explained uh, in the report. Uh, and and so you know the global methane initiative, World Meteorological Organization. There's a, a lot more that we have to do. Now, so if Taiwan makes this um, more of a priority, and I think. It does have to start with Taiwan. And Taiwan faces a very difficult uh, balancing act here because it needs to get support from the United States and other members of the international community, but it actually also needs to lean on Beijing, as I talked about earlier. And there are a lot of people in Taiwan who, who say, you know, well, President Ma shouldn't be getting permission from China. This isn't an issue of, from, of getting permission, but Beijing is blocking it. And so they've got to be leaning on Beijing. And they've got to find the right balance because I think to be quite fair, if Taiwan's only talking to Beijing, nothing's gonna happen. And if Taiwan is only talking to the United States and the international community, then they probably also won't make progress. So that's a balancing act that I think that Taiwan has to deal with. And if Taiwan is able to put this issue of in, uh, participation in the international community front and center in the U.S.-Taiwan relationship as well as in the cross-strait relationship, um, and again, sort of you know, publicly, privately make its case, then I hope uh, that in the future some of these things can be uh, done by an, an, an administration. I don't think that the argument that uh, you know, Beijing is somehow going to take punitive uh, measures actually holds water uh, because, again, we're not pushing for Taiwan to be treated as a sovereign state. We're not pushing for Taiwan to be treated in a way that is inconsistent with our bilateral uh, agreements with Beijing. But the challenge is, as you say, in any administration, not just this one, uh, people have a full plate. Um, you've got to convince people uh, that this is important. I think um, some of the arguments that I've made here, I've made in the report, Ambassador Lee has made, um, Taiwan's a democracy. Um, it actually sets an important um, uh, standard and model um, uh, for uh, many other countries, including uh, mainland China. Um, it is a, a, a good citizen in so many of the organizations that participates. It brings so much to the table. It can help advance American interests. So if we have a set of interests that we want to achieve in a particular organization, whether it be WHO, IKO, UNFCCC, having Taiwan on board, um, helping us to advance our interests, I think um, it w would, would, be, um, would be useful. We're always looking in multilateral settings to get countries to be working with us to advance uh, an agenda. So um, I, I, I think that Taiwan uh, has, has shown a willingness and uh, ability uh, to get out there and, uh, and support many of the, uh, of the interests that, uh, uh, that the U.S. wants to advance in these organizations. It's going to be a tough slog, um, no doubt about that, but uh, it's one that many of us have to keep, uh, we have to keep fighting about. Uh, and bringing it to people's attention. And Congress plays, I think, a very important role, as it did with ICAO. Um, I think that for a few years, support for Taiwan in Congress has been a little bit on the, on the downside. I see that as picking up. We have a lot more people, individuals in Congress now, who are really willing to work on some of these issues, and that helps. It puts, puts pressure on the administration, it brings the issue out into the public realm, um, and uh, particularly when it builds momentum to be able to uh, have on, on, an, on a particular issue, to have something that then the president signs into law that directs the Secretary of State to develop a strategy to achieve a very specific goal, that's very, very powerful. And uh, maybe now that they've done that in this case, in ICAO, maybe that can be done for others as well. I, th I think that's a strong case. And, uh, and when the Secretary says, you're right, Bonnie, let's do it, the next question will be, uh, how is Beijing going to react? Um, so let me ask a follow-up question. Do you think, um, as you've noted, and I've also heard this, there are Chinese scholars, diplomats even, who will privately, or in some cases scholars will publicly write, that it's time to be more uh, flexible uh, to sustain uh, the stability that's been added to cross-straits relations. Because it could go backwards if expectations aren't met. Um, and I think s smart analysts and diplomats uh, um, and experts in Beijing and in China have picked up on that. But but looking at it sort of from the top, do, do you think that under Xi Jinping there's a satisfaction 
with the overall approach to cross straits relations that in effect the response might be um, the policy is working. We're keeping just enough pressure on Taiwan. It's working fine. We don't need to change. Or do you think there may be some give in the months and years ahead um, at the leadership level in thinking about these issues in Beijing? Well, we all know that Xi Jinping worked for many years in Fujian. He's very familiar with Taiwan, with uh, businesses in Taiwan, um, and uh, many of the issues that are uh, at play in the cross-strait relationship. Um, he has inherited what I think is a fairly successful policy toward Taiwan and cross-strait relationship. But undoubtedly, he doesn't want to be in power for 10 years and just see it sort of muddle through. I think he's going to want to make progress as well. Um, I don't see any signs that he has any great ambitions uh, to achieve reunification any time in the, in the foreseeable future. I think the Chinese continue to hold that out as a longer-term goal. They have patience that they can move in a deliberate way uh, to improve cross-strait relations. And as I said earlier, you, they've got to win over the hearts and minds of the people in Taiwan, and they know that. And people in the mainland pay very close attention to polling on Taiwan. And when people in Taiwan say that they think that they, they feel oppressed by the people on the mainland, I mean, people pay attention to that. So um, I think that Xi Jinping will not be opposed to considering new ideas. Uh, there's a lot of smart scholars in, in the mainland who I think are making suggestions to their government all the time about how to further promote the cross-strait relationship. And sometimes there are policies that remain in place for reasons um, just due to inertia. You know, they've been there for a long time. You know, the fact that the foreign ministry is just constantly squeezing the uh, Taiwan's international space is actually somewhat incompatible with some of the other things that uh, Beijing is, is doing with Taiwan. To me, that's sort of a, a relic of the past when there weren't even the um, thousands of exchanges that we see taking place and the economic uh, and, 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 and trade cooperation and the, you know, 800, I think, or so flights a week uh, that are now taking place between the two sides of the strait. So this is something that I think that um, Xi Jinping could be um, convinced to reconsider, because ultimately, if he wants to further uh, develop the cross-strait relationship, this is, I think, an opportunity, a, ways of, of, uh, a means of doing that. And I think what he has to be convinced of is that the downside is not as great as China has feared uh, in the past. And again, I would uh, just say, uh, uh, with, with, with China's growing role in the international community, this is not something that China should really be fearful of. There's a lot more opportunity, a lot more upside, I think, uh, for China than downside. So uh, maybe some people in uh, particularly the influential scholarly community uh, in, in the mainland need to put this idea on the desk of, uh, of President Xi Jinping. Uh, and um, challenge the notion that the existing policy actually continues to serve China's interests. And so I hope you're going to translate this into Chinese. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not personally. <laughs> um, let me turn to Ambassador Lee, then we'll open it up. Um, the, uh, I remember when I was in the NSC uh, and we were contemplating a free trade agreement with Korea, a very senior USTR official said, we need to make sure our Korean friends understand that doing a trade agreement with the US is like going to the doctor and getting root canal surgery with no, with no Novocaine. <laughs> and that was uh, actually more pleasant than it actually is. Um, and uh, our Japanese friends are finding that out right now in the TPP negotiations. Um, it, it's, it's hard uh, negotiating these things. The results are always very significant. But, uh, the, but, the, but the process is hard. It requires some big decisions. And um, I note uh, that Ambassador Lee and President Ma and others have expressed a clear interest in joining TPP as quickly as possible. Um, but uh, it's going to take a lot of work. And I think the example of Japan and even Korea shows that it, there's a, there's a, a kind of pre-negotiation even, uh, and that momentum really has to build. Um, to convince the other partners, especially the U.S., but the other partners that um, a new entry 
is ready to take on the liberalization and the reform and restructuring necessary. And you now have experience with Singapore and with New Zealand, and I wonder, Ambassador Lee, if you could say something about what you've learned from that. Um, the, uh, the LY was very tough on um, cross straits negotiations, but in general, um, how would you describe the attitude towards um, these kind of agreements in the wake of uh, more experience um, negotiating these things with Singapore and New Zealand? Well, thank you. Uh, as far as I understand, you know, uh, in terms of uh, trade liberalization, we are very committed. And I think uh, this is one of the one of the aspects that uh, both the parties, you know, the bipartisan uh, consensus on that. You know, uh, it, uh, it, uh, you can see that uh, as this uh, A step, uh, our FTA with Singapore and our FTA with uh, New Zealand are quickly uh, approved by our LY. And I think uh, the one of the problem, I, I think, as uh, it is in uh, uh, Japan, is the uh, vested interest uh, in our domestic, <coughs> in our domestic uh, economic uh, sectors. You know, there are vested interests who are very powerful. For example, the the pork uh, industry and so on and so forth. So they are. They they don't want to see uh, free <coughs> the more opening up in, in terms of trade. But as far as the uh, government is concerned, we are very committed. And our approach is the so-called uh, building block approach. And uh, as to that, we want to, uh, first of all, uh, with the uh, United States, we want to uh, sign a BIA, a bilateral investment agreement with the United States. And uh, uh, we have already uh, signed a different uh, uh, agreement, uh, for example, the e-commerce agreement with the United States, and, and so we want to, you know, sort of uh, set up more building block, and finally we can sign an FTA with the United States. We know it's difficult, but we are determined, and so uh, we uh, enter negotiations uh, with other countries, especially uh, members of the uh, TPP. You know, we have finished the uh, feasibility studies with uh, Indonesia and India. And uh, we are now conducting feasibility studies with the uh, Philippines and Malaysia and so on and so forth. So the effort is still there. We are continue, continuing to uh, work hard to negotiate some kind of, through building block uh, approach, some kind of uh, economic cooperation agreement with other countries, especially member of APEC, uh, TPP, and so on. Yeah. Um, Thank you, uh, and uh, that momentum is important. Bonnie was right to say the biggest obstacle to greater international space for Taiwan is, is, is China right now, but it's very hard for Taipei to control that variable. But the variable you can control um, is your own domestic decision making and market liberalization. And with real momentum and participation in TPP, Taiwan will instantly have 12 de facto allies to get greater international space because the issues in TPP cover or, or intersect with a lot of the issues in these international organizations. Yeah. And you will have 12 um, governments that know you well uh, that want you to be part of this process. And so to me, that is the, the most important thing I would argue that, that Taipei can do. And not Bonnie has it in here, um, uh, but it, it may matter more than anything else. Um, of course, we also have to get Trade Promotion Authority. We have a bit of homework on that front, too. Um, let's uh, open it up to questions. Um, I'll, I'll recognize people and um, yeah, start with you, sir. We have a microphone. Thank you. John Zan with CTI TV of Taiwan. Thank you. Um, in Taiwan's uh, um, effort to expand its international space, um, we all understand the need for the United States to help uh, soften or overcome China's objection. That's, you know, we all understand, uh, something that we all understand. What I do not understand is sometimes there are things the United States can do even without China's objection to help Taiwan. For instance, the, uh, um, the proposed and now canceled visit uh, to Taiwan by uh, the uh, EPA Administrator McCarthy. Uh, wh wh why wouldn't the United States uh, go ahead with the, uh, the visit? Um, uh, because even China did not voice objection. I don't understand this. Bonnie and Mike, could you help me? Thank you. 
Um, I, I would say I'm not familiar with the details of this. I've seen some reports, and I think sometimes there are um, things that are reported that are not completely accurate. Uh, there were some reports about why uh, Representative Jing Putong was called back to Taiwan, which are clearly not true. Um, so rumors have a way of developing and, and often uh, are, are really turn out to be not factual. But I'm just going to give you my personal opinion on uh, the issue of uh, the United States sending cabinet level uh, officials uh, to Taiwan. Um, this is something that we used to do quite frequently um, in, uh, uh, for example, when uh, Bill Clinton was uh, president. I think 13 years ago was the last time we did this. And as I talked earlier about uh, some of the waning of U.S. Uh, support under uh, Chen Shui-bian for some of the things Taiwan was doing, I think that this issue sort of got caught up in that period. Uh, and uh, now it has been a long time since the United States has sent a cabinet level official, and Beijing has gotten somewhat used to it. Um, I have certainly heard Chinese officials uh, say that uh, this is not something that the United States should return to, this practice of doing so. United States cooperates with Taiwan on so many important issues, um, energy, environment, um, uh, even, um, you know, we have similar veterans affairs organizations. Um, there are many kinds of uh, exchanges that, that we should have. Um, and, and so, you know, I think that this is just something that uh, shouldn't, that, that Beijing shouldn't oppose. I don't know about this particular case, but I just think that this is a practice that um, um, we, we, it should be part of the U.S.-Taiwan relationship. And it can be done, I think, in a way that is consistent with our commitments, uh, um, not only uh, to Taiwan, but also uh, to the mainland. So um, if, uh, if, if, if we can uh, get, get some trip scheduled in, in the future by a cabinet-level official, I think that that's, it's good for the U.S.-Taiwan relationship, and I don't think it should be seen as harmful to Chinese interests. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the visit was canceled. It was canceled, presumably, because uh, press reports came out a few hours uh, before uh, the, uh, the scheduled uh, formal announcement. Why, why is that, Mike? I don't know. I mean, like Bonnie, I'm just reading those reports uh, as well. Um, I do know from my own experience in government that, and this was during the Chen Shui Bian years, it was tougher, that uh, cabinet members who don't work directly on foreign policy who are the only ones who are under our system supposed to go, um, are easily frightened um, by the appearance of Chinese opposition. So even if the, there's no formal protest by the government, it doesn't take much for uh, Beijing to signal its displeasure and uh, deter a cabinet member. And if you're you know, the Secretary of Energy, uh, EPA administrator, you have a long list of very hard issues with, with China. And um, uh, it, it, it basically takes the national security advisor or the president calling and saying, I really need you to make this trip in many cases, or maybe the secretary of state. Um, and so um, we'll, we'll, I don't know the specifics of this case, but um, I would hope it would cause a rethink within the administration so that they start getting the signal up to the top that this is a priority to get cabinet level meetings back on track after 13 years. I can understand why someone would not want to be the first one to break the ice after such a long time. Um, and so it really, there has to be top cover and there has to be a decision that, that, that I think comes from high up that this is important and to start talking about who should be the one, the one to go. But that said, I don't know the specifics here. I don't even know for certain that it was canceled. This is just a report, so. Um, wait, sir. You don't want to comment on that, I assume. No. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, Ken Wang from TBA. Uh, thank you for this great report, Bernie. This is good. Uh, I, my question is about Taiwan Policy Art 2013. So uh, I recall the, the content in the Taiwan TPA, they spell out the participation of international organization. So the question I have is uh, how feasible of the TPA to replace or to enhance the TIA? Or maybe next year, shall we push the TPA to help our participation in the international organization? Okay, thank you. Well, there are obviously many different ways to promote Taiwan's greater participation in uh, international organizations. This TPA is, um, is one of them. 
Um, but of course, what happens in something like the Taiwan Policy Act is then there's lots of other provisions. Um, and and if you when you put all of these provisions uh, together, you some I, I think you won't get as much support because there's lots of things that are involved. I think that the that by breaking out, for example, the uh, legislation regarding Taiwan's participation in ICAO, that enabled uh, Taiwan to get much more support. I mean, it's just huge majorities in, in the House and Senate that were willing to support this. Um, and then, of course, the president's willingness to sign it, which is uh, also critically important. So I think that whether it's the recent TPA or the one that was being you know, developed several years ago, um, I think it's just harder to get a lot of support from a majority of Congress and from the executive branch when you're putting in a lot of different issues together. Hi, uh, Nadia Chow with the Liberty Times. Uh, I have a question to Bonnie and Green, but not uh, Mike, but not necessarily related to government. Uh, I think many young people, bright young people in Taiwan, just wondering, you know, if they're really interested in the international affairs and they have a, you know, dedication to serve the global common, but they don't have any chance to even intern for an international organization like you know INF or World Bank. I wonder when uh, you know you talk about Taiwan's participation, is that more practical, you know, to help those young people to be able to you know intern or work for the international organization? So you know, a younger generation coming will not feel like disconnected from the whole international community. Thank you. you want to go first? No, I think that's a very good point, and that's uh, that is one more reason why this is an important issue. Um, I, you know, Taiwan is at the leading edge of a lot of technologies, technological development. Uh, uh, Taiwan has a, despite the debates over nu nuclear reactors, which Japan and Korea are going through too, Taiwan has a quite sophisticated energy uh, policy and strategy. Um, I'd answer just by connecting it to the earlier question about um, how to get cabinet members to go. It seems to me that um, uh, in, Taipei ought to be thinking about how to connect um, policy experts, not just like me and Bonnie um, on Asia policy or relations between us, but to connect people who are experts on energy policy, environmental policy, get them to Taipei or bring delegations here and nurture uh, a cohort so that when they become the special assistant to the APA administer or they become the secretary of energy, they know Taiwan, they like Taiwan, they know how much Taiwan has to offer. That would take care of both the problem of making sure there are people around our cabinet secretaries who are experts on energy, environment, and so forth, who know and like and appreciate Taiwan's contribution. But also it's an outlet for younger Taiwanese who may not, or experts who may not be able to join international organizations to interact with their counterparts and shape the debate. So um, it, it, I, what you're getting at is a consequence of this um, effort by Beijing to limit international space for Taiwan, and it's unfortunate. But there are ways around it. I would just add that um, I think it's really important to get more students and young people from Taiwan coming to the United States. I haven't looked at the numbers recently, but my sense is just from being around Washington, going and visiting universities, I go speak, um, there's more and more people coming from the mainland. I have fewer people coming from Taiwan. Um, and I think many of them go to the mainland. That's great. Um, they see more opportunities there. But if Taiwan wants to be part of the international system, then its students have to, has to, they have to go everywhere. And I'd like to see more of them coming to the United States. Um, I talk to many professors who just tell me they have fewer students from Taiwan in their international affairs programs. Um, so um, I, it, uh, I, in specific answer to your question, I think we have to do both things. You know, if you can't, probably can't get students involved in trying to intern, even at a place like the IMF, if they don't see that there's a career path that's going to get them to be able to have some job down the road. Um, and, you know, they may have more prospect in the IMF than they have at some place um, that's like in a UN organization that Taiwan doesn't play um, any role in at all. But um, so if we could work both of those things, we're opening up doors for Taiwan um, and its, its people, its NGOs, as well as uh, ad 
as a government to participate very broadly in different aspects of org uh, international organizations, then I think naturally students, young people are going to want to be part of that because they'll see career opportunities and they'll see it as exciting to be part of uh, what's going on, uh, you know, internationally. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I, I think it's really important to get youth involved, but we got to make sure that they have opportunities to develop that into, into a career. My name is Garrett Van der Wees, editor of Taiwan Communique. Um, it, it's a very important topic and many good recommendations uh, did come out of it. There's one though where I would have a bit of a hesitation. At the end you said, Bonnie, that uh, US and Beijing would have to work with international organizations to revise the existing charters. Uh, so we can have observer status and so on and so forth. Wouldn't that really open a door to cement Taiwan's status as a second rank nation if it is in the WHO as an observer and ICAO as a guest every three years, you know, then everybody says, well, it's okay, Taiwan is being taken care of. And the basic question of really the right of the people in Taiwan to be a full an equal member in the international community is then negated and, and pushed to the side? Or do you propose this as a kind of intermediate step towards a longer term uh, full membership in international organizations? Can I add to his question? Sure. <laughs> Which is, because uh, this struck me too, I, I didn't have the same reaction. My reaction was, how would you do this and not violate the six assurances, one of which is that we don't you know, settle the this position of Taiwan bilaterally with Beijing. And I'm sure you've thought of this because you are encyclopedic on that issue, but, I'm, but if you could explain in process terms how you do that. Okay, um, Mike's uh, point is very important and you will see in my recommendations where I have listed this recommendation that I very clearly say with Taiwan's support because I wouldn't advocate that the United States and China settle a problem that Taiwan has, even if it's in Taiwan's interest, without working with Taiwan. So this is something that would have to be through consultations with Taiwan as to how uh, government in Taipei, how the people would like to see this proceed, whether indeed it is a good idea, and it may not be. Um, and again, I, the huge caveat here is that I'm not an international lawyer, but since I've heard this from lawyers on the mainland, it really has gotten me quite interested. Um, and the mainland is increasingly this, looking at issues from a very legalistic perspective. And sometimes I think that they raise this as an, as an obstacle, you know, oh, can't have Taiwan participate in the UNFCCC because observer status just is not for non-sovereign states, end story. So, um, I agree with you, Garrett, that um, there should be no closing of the door to Taiwan's full membership. Uh, but one could envision how charters could be changed uh, either to first allow Taiwan maybe to be observer in organizations that now they can't be. And UNFCCC really is an example of that. You look at the charter um, and NGOs can participate, but apparently the way that observer status is defined, uh, Taiwan cannot. The ICAO Council, um, as a, uh, a sort of regional entity, or I forget what the exact wording is, um, you know, Taiwan could be a full observer. So if you create these opportunities in some of these charters, Taiwan might be in the, in the near term able to participate far more easily. But in the longer run, I agree with you. I, Taiwan should be a full member. Um, and, and eventually, maybe some of these organizations need to be opened up to non-sovereign states if Taiwan does not become a sovereign state. So, uh, but this is something that um, also Taiwan and the mainland are going to have to work out. And at the end of the day, there may be some resolution, I don't know, um, uh, in the years to come uh, between mainland and Taiwan about how to deal with this issue. Uh, maybe the mainland will say that Taiwan can sort of, you know, nominally just say that it is, uh, it is, it is a China, <laughs> whatever China name it wants to be, and it can participate in international organizations. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it's hard to say. We all have to be creative in trying to promote Taiwan's interest, and you know that even better than I do. Uh, 
Bill Tucker. Uh, I served in the Reagan administration, and uh, and I recall a situation where the president of Taiwan was going to visit his alma mater, Cornell, and uh, and uh, the Chinese raised all kinds of uh, objections to this you know, visit, and uh, and they even. Uh, threatened to do all these kind of things. And uh, then the Congress passed a resolution, uh, you know, saying he could, that we could issue the visa. Well, they ordered the State Department to issue the visa. And so the State Department issued the visa, and he came to Taiwan. I mean, he came to, uh, to Cornell, and, you know, the earth didn't stop rotating. And so uh, why, do we, uh, why do we listen to all these objections that China makes over what Taiwan or we do? I mean, we are an independent nation also, and we, I think we pay too much attention to what China says we sh the relationship between our country and Taiwan should be. And I'd like your observations as to why we, why we listen to this. I mean, Ch China would have as much to lose as we would if, the, if relationships uh, deteriorate between the two countries. We are, have a lot of businesses in China. China could not maintain their economy uh, without uh, the U.S. and and the businesses from the West, uh, and so we've got we've got nothing to lose by standing up to China. And I, I, I fail to understand why we don't do what we sh should do as a nation. I very much appreciate your uh, your your question. Um, I do think it's in U.S. interest to stand up for Taiwan more. And as I said earlier, if we have lots of other countries around the world doing the same, um, you know, China's not going to strike out at all of us. Uh, we, we, need, we have to be a leader. Um, I would like to see uh, uh, like-minded countries. I'd like to see the EU and Australia. Uh, uh, Japan has been pretty active in standing up for Taiwan. Uh, and so there, there's there's more work to be done, and there are countries that are nervous about intimidation from China, and in some cases their concerns are reasonable. And we have seen in recent years uh, China's willingness to use, for example, economic measures to coerce countries uh, to change their policies on specific issues. We've seen this, for example, uh, last year against the Philippines, because the Philippines has brought a case. Uh, to the International Tri Tribunal on the Law of the Sea, uh, which involves China's nine-dash line in the South China Sea. And uh, so the mainland uh, quarantined uh, bananas and tropical fruits, you know, coming in from the Philippines. And of course, an even more well-known case was in 2010 when uh, Beijing wanted uh, Japan to release the fishermen, the captain of the, of the, uh, of the uh, fisherman, the fishing boat that had been arrested and curtailed uh, and sought to halt the, uh, the export of rare earth minerals to Japan. Um, in the case of Norway, we saw when Leo Xiaobo was, was given the uh, Nobel Peace Prize by the Norwegian Peace Committee, not by the Norwegian government, uh, you know, the Chinese tried to stop importing salmon. And uh, to some extent, Norway is really still in the doghouse. And I can give more and more and more examples. It's, there's just many of them. So countries are worried. Um, so I think... Uh, there has to be an effort to prevent Beijing just from hiving off individual nations and punishing them. Um, and yes, we need to be a leader. Um, I think that there's probably less that China is willing to do to us than some other nations. But uh, we should be standing up for our rights and our values. And I completely agree with you on that score. Uh, but um, there is, I think, growing angst uh, in this country in lots of quarters that uh, are uh, relationship with China is so important that we should not be challenging China on specific issues, whether it's visas for uh, our journalists that are about to be kicked out of uh, China or uh, for Taiwan. I mean, there's a long list of issues. Um, and I would say that when it comes to our own interests and our own values, we shouldn't hesitate to stand up for them. I just had... We, we sh I think you're getting this, we should be more confident in the future of U.S.-China relations. And I think the temptation to um, uh, withhold support for Taiwan in international space comes from a fear that we're going to irritate China and that 
um, U.S.-China relations could easily spin out of control and easily go into crisis, <clears throat> and, um, and that the way to avoid that is to avoid irritations in the relationship. And, and that often is the view of senior people in Republican and Democratic administrations. And if they, if, if they studied Asia better, if they, if they knew uh, China better, I think they would be more confident. It's usually not the China experts um, at senior levels of government who are saying this. It's people who don't know China that well and are very, very nervous that things could spin out of control if they allow irritations to grow in the relationship. So that is why you know, certain people tend to be more cautious. But we ought to be more confident uh, about U.S.-China relations. I think that's what you're, what, what you're getting at. And, um, and, <coughs> and uh, the other thing is, you know, it depends on how you think about the rise of Chinese power. <coughs> um, it, it, it seems to me, and I think a, lo a lot of people, that um, uh, Taiwan is exhibit A in how China will use its power as it gets more power. And there are other examples. Xinjiang, the, the examples Bonnie gave. And so as a practical matter, not just because we're democracies and, and have common values, but as a practical matter, we ought to be very concerned about how China uses coercion or is agile and open with less powerful counterparts, because that is the future uh, of how China will use its power. Um, and these are issues that, you know, where there are different views in government, and that's why our policy tends to change a little bit depending on who's in charge in certain agencies. And I'm not making a partisan statement here. There are people in Republican and Democratic sides who have both yeah. views. Yeah. We, um, the one other thing I'd say, just, you know, we, I was in the NSC the first five years of Bush. Um, we, uh, we lost something in those years uh, during Chen Shui Bien. It wasn't all President Chen's fault, but we lost something. We lost a level of trust at, at the highest levels. And we also lost um, the congressional relationship. And the encouraging thing, even though this, the senators couldn't make it today, the encouraging thing is that Senators Menendez and Inhofe were willing to come here, that they passed this legislation. We've lost Inouye, we've lost Webb, we've lost a lot of senior Asia people in the Senate and the House. But it's, it is encouraging, as Bonnie noted, that they're replacing that step by step. So that's, that will help, I think. Yeah, we have time for one more, I think. Sorry, I gave a long monologue there. Yeah. Uh, I'm uh, Colonel Du, I'm from Taiwan, a visiting fellow at uh, Atlantic Council. Uh, very good uh, presentation. I have a question about the ADIZ. It's very interesting uh, issue. That uh, just a couple of days ago, Korea uh, declared his own KADIZ. I think there's a contentious issues right now. Uh, it's it's uh, happening right now. Um, some scholars argue that uh, that will help the United States to uh, substantially uh, shift his focus to the to Asia uh, region, and I think it, it, in the near future it, it doesn't seem that the China will, will back down uh, by uh, cancel that uh, that the ADIZ. I just have one question about that: What do you see the the United States uh, will uh, uh, resolve the, the problem, especially that? area overlaps uh, so many countries involved in the ADIZ and what uh, Taiwan uh, should, should play uh, in that uh, issue. Thank you. Are you Air Force? Uh, no, I'm Marine. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Marine, all right, all right. So what do you care about airspace? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, well, first we should tell everybody here who may not know that Taiwan has its own ADIZ. Uh, Korea has recently extended, announced that it will extend the ADIZ, but of course had a pre-existing uh, ADIZ. So it's not just Japan uh, and China. But now, um, uh, a few years ago, Japan extended its ADIZ into Taiwan's ADIZ. So there have been some problems with overlapping um, air defense identification uh, zones. Uh, so, you know, clearly, um, I, th I think maybe you suggested in your uh, question that somehow the United States sees these increased tensions as an opportunity to rebalance to the region. I don't think that's true. <laughs> I don't think that the United States is looking for uh, increased tensions in the region. Uh, when countries in the region get nervous, um, I think there's actually a lot of expectations then for the United States to come and help solve problems, which uh, really creates um, potential challenges for the U.S. because there's become sort of 
angst and nervousness in the region that maybe we don't have enough resources or staying power or commitments or somehow we're getting sucked back into the Middle East. Um, but you know, what's driving the United States to Asia is first and foremost the economic dynamism uh, in the region, the desire to be part of uh, the economic um, activities uh, in the region, the growth of the region, expand our exports, um, and of course to reinforce peace and stability in the region. Um, and you know, Mike's going to tell you about the book he's writing, but uh, <laughs> historically the United States has played a very important role in preserving peace and stability. And there has been a consistent desire by the vast majority of countries in the region for the United States to continue to sort of play that role um, as a, as balancer. Um, and I think that there are many countries that believe that if the United States is less attentive to the region, um, or in a worse case, if we really were to pull out, that that would be disastrous. Um, and uh, I would say even China sees potential downsides. I think it's ambivalent about, uh, about US presence. So um, you know, this is a moment where um, there, is, uh, there are steps being taken by various countries to defend their own interests. I think that China sees this as a way of defending its, its interests, but its interests are expanding. It's expanding out into the near seas, right? The East China Sea, the South China Sea, and the Yellow Sea. Um, and, and the Chinese want to signal other countries that their interests are going to, should be uh, respected and, and, and adhered to by others. Um, the problem is there's a lot of countries that also have their own interests. And um, so this is, this is really an issue that could potentially get quite dangerous. Um, the, I think that the declaration of this new ADIZ by China has really increased the potential for an accident that nobody wants to see. And, and certainly the country that really last wants to see war in the region is China. They're, after all, trying to rise uh, peacefully uh, and continue to develop uh, economically. So, um, you know, this, is th th this isn't a good thing for the United States, but hopefully we can help uh, other countries to manage it. Thank you. Um, Bonnie, congratulations on the report. Um, I look forward to the Chinese edition. And uh, <laughs> I appreciate very much that um, Michael Schiffer helped arrange this and the interest here on the Hill and uh, this, uh, this document will be useful, I think, for those on the Hill who want to keep the administration honest on this issue um, and useful for people in the administration who care about it and for all of us. So uh, uh, congratulations, Bonnie. Thank you, and thank you all for joining us. I actually already have a Chinese journal that is going to print oh, really? a long excerpt. Yep. <laughs> really? It's called Leaders. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. I think it I think it has my name. Yeah.